Economic Union. Uh, Michael was educated at Harvard, Trinity College Dublin, and the LSE. He co-founded ZN in 1994 and created the Global Financial Centers Index. He's an emeritus professor and trustee at Gretham uh, College. His book, The Price of Fish, A New Approach to Wicked Economics and Better Decisions, won the 2012 Independent Publishers Book Awards Finance Investment and Economics Gold Prize. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Michael Minnelli. Well, thank you. Uh, that's extraordinarily kind. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. It's, uh, with some trepidation, I hasten to add, when you come up on stage after somebody who does 927 speeches a year, uh, you realize you're very unlikely uh, to, to shine but I'll do my best to set the scene this morning. Um, when Herbie and I were chatting uh, about this conference many months ago, I think we made two important changes. The first is you'll notice the lovely orange logo uh, that Herbie's done, which suits the church here, the, the famous Dutch church. Um, the second thing was that we'd originally thought this might be a conference about why, where insurance exchanges should meet capital markets exchanges. But on the morning of the 24th, we realized that nobody would have much interest in that uh, on the 24th of June, and we decided we'd change the conference to something about Brexit. But we also realized that by the time the conference was held, people would be bored to tears with Brexit. Uh, and so we thought we would uh, look, really, at uh, what, what might the new shape of Europe be. And we thought about this theme, you know, towards a, a new Hanseatic League. Now, some of the things that are quite interesting about the Hanseatic League um, will come out in my talk in a moment, but I think it's also important just to look at where we are today. We're here uh, in the Dutch church, which was founded in the early 1500s as part of the, the Reformation movement, a very peculiar and interesting relationship with Henry VIII and later his son, uh, and this church uh, is quite a venerable and old one, and it sits on the site of Augustinian Prior, the Augustinian Friary, uh, which is after which the area is named, Austin Friars. And you'll see around here uh, some very, very, very venerable city institutions. Just up the road is the Carpenters, one of the older livery companies. One of the wealthiest livery companies, Drapers, is just behind the church here. In fact, for those of you of an historical bent, uh, this is the site of Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. Uh, this is uh, Thomas Cromwell occupied uh, what is currently Drapers Hall today. And as you walk around here, you'll see that Vehicles are restricted in their access and their tonnage to about one and a half tons. The reason for that is if you have a heavier vehicle, it will go crashing down into the cellars, which extend some 60 to 70 feet down and are actually Thomas Cromwell's original wine cellars. So it's a very interesting area. And I think it shows uh, the importance of trade to the city of London, as Sir Michael was saying. Uh, this has been a trading entrepont really uh, since the 16th century when it moved from being largely a commodities exporting country to being a country based much more around trade. Now, trade is, uh, is an important thing. As we look around the global uh, s centers uh, around the world, uh, what makes them function is trade. They, they, they grow. There's no need for finance in many ways when you're just doing some sort of agricultural commodity or extraction industry. What drives financial services is trade itself. So what I'd like to do is uh, challenge you today to consider what is the future trading landscape of Europe going to look like over the next, say, 500 years. And to do that, we're going to look back 500 years as well. Now, the global, oh, sorry, the global trading landscape uh, that, we, that we see today is one that I think is intrinsically based around digital. And digital has changed from sort of old maps of the one on the previous slide to a world where we're looking at something like over 100 centers would claim to be financial centers globally. Um, and there'll be some centers that will be represented here uh, today that aren't actually on our slide at all. Um, but we track about 100 of these centers. Why is that fun or interesting? Well, it's interesting because financial centers give a huge amount of vibrancy to the places where they're located. You get a lot of economic advantages in terms of information, being part of this network allows you to gain from global trade, even if you're not uh, actually producing. Uh, and I think from a policymaker's perspective, it's one of the very interesting areas where you can make or break an entire sector based on policy decisions alone. As Sir Michael pointed out, you know, business friendly is arguably you know, the first starting point uh, to building a financial center. 
they can also come crashing down. Uh, the, the history of London is not uh, one of seamless uh, rise. It's had several periods of uh, punctuation, uh, most recently after the war. Yes, there were the euro bond markets, but FX didn't really take off until exchange controls were removed in October 79. So the modern, uh, the modern city that we're all proud of here is actually a relatively recent invention in terms of scale. And this uh, little picture over here on the right uh, will just give you, it's from the 1375 uh, Catalan at Atlas, their world map, their Mapa Mundi. Um, and it shows a king, the richest king in the world in 1375. Widely reputed. Any guesses? Timbuktu. And today, Mali is just a desert wasteland, you know, where the, the sands and the tumbleweeds effectively kind of blow through the city. So you can make and break a financial center, you know, very, very easily. We'll have an entire session on that this afternoon. But uh, the theme today is also about the Hansa. Well, um, I was uh, desperate to try and find a Trump or a, a Clinton uh, slide, but I had to get the slides in before uh, the election uh, the other day. Um, so I was unable to, but I thought I'd uh, go back to Bush, you know, read my lips, trade, you know, that, that's what it's all about. Um, the Hanseatic League uh, was founded roughly 1159 in Lübeck, and it died out roughly about 1669. Uh, we, we'll see that in a minute. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, for 400 years, it dominated Northern Europe. Um, the trade routes really began uh, out of Lübeck, Hamburg, and Bremen, and we're privileged today to have uh, Professor uh, Hans-Jörg Schmidt-Trenz here uh, from Hamburg, who knows far more about uh, that area than I do. And branching out from those uh, free Freistaats or the Hanseatic Free States, it, it is argued by many scholars, or some scholars at least, that it contained up to about 70 cities. Uh, the cities were broadly Germanic, in fact, Blattdeutsch as opposed to just uh, Germanic in total, but there were foreign cities involved in it. And uh, the Hanseatic League uh, during this period, although it had a tremendous amount of trade influence, is in many ways probably more important in the modern era for the myths that it left us. And that mythical influence is extremely strong. If you've ever traveled across uh, northern Germany, you, you, you will find Hansa everything. Um, we've got uh, signs uh, pro proclaiming the free and uh, Hanseatic states of Hamburg or Lübeck. Um, we have books uh, like Derek Meister's books surrounding uh, Lübeck in the early days. Um, we have uh, things like Hansa Sale. Uh, we have a Hansa Museum in Lübeck. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of things that celebrate the Hanseatic League. People are extremely proud of it. My favorite is probably there on the top, Hansa Plast. So you can actually have Hansa plasters when you get a wound, you know, you're able to heal yourself with the Hansa. Um, actually, it had a, a, a far more important role, though, in shaping our views of commerce. Uh, intriguingly, uh, Adam Smith in 1776 in The Wealth of Nations refers to the Hanseatic League. Now, what's he referring to? I mean, I, I just told you that the League effectively had its last meeting in 1669. He's writing over 100 years later. Uh, he, he didn't have Wikipedia. His library facilities up in Edinburgh would have been okay, but nothing brilliant. What did he think of the Hansa? Well, he was going on this myth of strong, independent states trading freely with each other without central control, which, of course, is the theme of the wealth of nations in many ways, the, the individual parts uh, being, uh, being greater when, the, when, the, when they're assembled. Another area, often unremarked, is that the Hanseatic League features very strongly in the, federal, uh, the Federalist Papers. For those of you who are not up on your American history, uh, having had a go at a, at a poor sort of uh, Articles of Confederation, the Americans in 1789 came up with a new constitution. But this constitution had to be sold to the people. And so three writers, uh, John Adams, Andrew Hamilton, and John Jay, wrote a series of argumentative papers under pseudonyms where they would argue the pros and cons of various bits of the Constitution as it was assembled. And one of the most important bits was how would these states trade with each other? And they referred copiously in the Federalist Papers to this Hanseatic League and why it was such a good thing and why it was so important. And again, they, like Adam Smith, uh, didn't have the wealth of modern research. So they were going on the myth. The myth was very, very important to people. But what, might, what was the reality? Well, as I said earlier, possibly up to about 70 uh, cities were involved in the Hanseatic League. 
And something most Londoners don't know is that uh, the Hanseatic League extended what were called contours or warehouses, effectively outposts that they had. And these outposts were all across, uh, all across England, Boston, uh, King's Lynn, Hull, Norwich, uh, Yarmouth, Ipswich. These all had contours. And here in London, we had our own contour. In fact, uh, etymologists believe that the very word sterling for our pound uh, comes from the Bristol contour, and they were referring to the, the, the solidity of the money that the Easterlings had, the Easterlings being the Hanseatic League. So you can see this uh, in, intense association here. Within London itself, uh, we have uh, great Hanseatic inspirations. Uh, the, the top right here, there's a plaque to uh, what is called the Stahlhof. The Stahlhof, or steel yard, uh, was an area exclusively reserved for these German merchants. Uh, it occupies the site of Cannon Street. And during that period, it was restricted access for English people. Uh, they, they were unable to enter this area freely. So think about it. Here in the center of London, we had a free trade zone for 500 years that locals were not allowed to go into. Uh, Hans Holbein uh, actually came over to London to paint because he could freely go in into this area. Um, in, and finally, uh, just to kind of round out the history, um, when Cannon Street was uh, being constructed in 1853, the land was bought from the three cities of Hamburg, uh, Bremen, and Lübeck, who still owned it in 1853. But it's not all rosy or romantic. Uh, there are quite a few cautionary lessons one can learn from the Hansa. Uh, this is a picture of a museum that I sailed into off Simbister in the Shetland Isles. I sailed into this boring little village, uh, not expecting to find a full-blown Hanseatic museum. Uh, such are the wonders of the EU who had funded it. Um, anyway, there I am uh, in this little, little museum, finding out all sorts of things, but also the oppression that was there. The Shetlands produced about 10% of salted fish across Europe, and the Hanseatic merchants had grabbed that and created a monopoly. There were several uprisings in the Shetland Islands where uh, the German merchants were killed, uh, revolution, if you will. Uh, and then finally, when they managed to break three, free in the uh, late 1600s, they then had the joys of the Act of Union of 1707, which meant that, again, the English took over uh, their fisheries and created another monopoly. So what do we learn in terms of uh, things, in terms of cautions? Well, I think the biggest thing was, we, there's many arguments about why the Hanseatic League didn't persist, but I think one of them is it didn't make a lot of friends. Um, you know, it had a very, very monopolistic approach to life, and if it could establish a monopoly, it would use it and oppress it. So it wasn't quite the paragon of free trade uh, that we like to think. And of course, this then coincides with the rise of the nation state, and that tension between the nation state and its various constituent parts, be they regions or states or lender or cities or city-states, is always going to be a tough one. So what kind of lessons can we learn? Well, I think the first thing is uh, you really can't be an international business center without international people. Um, you need to have a free flow of people and trade. And the Hansa was, was famous for the flows of people and really establishing the rights to travel and the rights to trade and fighting for them when it could. 